Hey everybody, what's going on? Dean Meadows for The Daily Apologist, and this is The Daily Apologist podcast on YouTube. We have finally gotten the software and the necessary materials to actually do the podcast on YouTube. So for all of you who are fans of The Daily Apologist and fans of the podcast, you can now get the podcast on YouTube and also on Anchor. And I am super excited to begin this journey, and I hope you're excited as well. So over the last uh, couple of weeks, I've been looking at the deconversion of John Steingard, the lead singer of Hawk Nelson. It was all over the news. It was all over social media. I took a look at it, and uh, what what a post, man. It's like nine pages on Instagram. It was gut-wrenching. I know that it was heartfelt and sincere by John, but I also wanted to take an analytical look at the reasons for why he deconverted. Now, I'm just looking at the, the big main reasons why he deconverted. And and one of those reasons is, is really a topic that I think a lot of Christians are scared of. Notice uh, he says here in his uh, Instagram post, if God is loving, why does he send people to hell? And I, I have to admit, that's a, a very tough question for a lot of Christians because one, we oftentimes don't want the blowback that comes with answering that question. And two, we don't like to think about the people who are closest to us, who we love and we dearly care about, uh, who are not Christians, um, being uh, in hell. And so oftentimes we just avoid the subject and we don't even ask this type of question. I mean, if someone asked me this question, how would I answer that question? So that's what we're going to try and do today on today's show. Now, on the surface, it doesn't seem like Steingard's question, or, or even just the question of, you know, why does a loving God send people to hell? It's not obvious that those two things are uh, a contradiction. It's not like they're in the same category of being a married bachelor, whereas, you know, to be a bachelor means to not be married, and to be married means to not be uh, a bachelor. It doesn't seem it's that obvious. So it seems like there are at least a couple of assertions that are being made, maybe not necessarily by John, but maybe the average skeptic. And those two assertions would be that God is all-powerful. If God's all-powerful, then he can certainly create a world in which people freely give their lives to him, give their lives to him and they're saved uh, and don't have to go to hell. And then the other assertion is that God is all-loving that he could, if God is all loving, he could certainly do that and would want that uh, to where people could freely give, everybody would freely give, not that they could, but they would freely give their lives to him and not go to hell. So how do we navigate those assertions? Well, the first point I want to make is that in order for these two assertions to be true, they have to be necessarily true, which means they have to be absolutely true. There's no other possible scenario available. This just is the way that it is. So we have to develop an answer that shows that it's possible that there's another scenario available which preserves God being all-powerful, God being all-loving, but could still justly um, send people to hell. And so in order to do that, we really have to look at three main doctrines, and, and that's the doctrine of God's justice, the doctrine of God's love, and the doctrine of free will. So someone comes up to you and says, well, why can't I just live off of God's divine justice? I mean, if you're telling me that, that God is all-knowing, that God is all-powerful, that God is intelligent, that God is fair, then certainly his divine justice uh, could be uh, good enough. Well, and, and I've actually had people say that to me before, ironically. Well, that's not the solution <laughs> to the to the answer. That's that's the problem because Scripture clearly teaches that God's standard of uh, moral righteousness is His holiness, and that according to Romans chapter three twenty three, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans six twenty three says that the wages of sin is death. So if I if I just rely on the divine justice of God, I find myself really in the same position as the Titanic. Uh, I, I'm sunk. I am absolutely positively done because I can't meet his standard. 
of moral righteousness, of moral good, which is his holiness. So if I just throw myself on his divine justice, then I don't deserve heaven. And and here's the thing, nobody is ever good enough uh, to go to heaven. And so we have that piece in God's divine justice, but it's not as if God is some uh, cosmic tyrant or cosmic dictator that's kind of looking around on earth and looking for somebody who uh, just stepped outside of the box so he can blast them with a lightning bolt. That's a, a wrong depiction of God from a Christian worldview. Clearly, the Christian worldview promotes the idea that God is love, according to 1 John, and that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. Here's an interesting quote that I found in the Old Testament from Ezekiel chapter 18. It says there, uh, Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his ways and live? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. So turn and live. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die? Clearly God here in the book of Ezekiel is pleading with Israel not to go down the path that they're going, not to continue to walk this path of rebellion and that he doesn't have any pleasure in their death. And so what does he say? He says, hey, I want you to turn back and come back to me. And, and this is certainly reinforced in the New Testament, we see in Second Peter 3, 9, it says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come uh, to reach repentance. First Timothy 2, chapter 4, says that God desires that all people are to be saved uh, and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so we see this instance in the text of Scripture where you've got divine justice that says nobody's good enough and nobody deserves heaven, but also you have this loving God that desires and literally pleads with people uh, to come to a knowledge of the truth, to come into a relationship with him. And so what is he to do? <laughs> What's the solution to bridge this massive chasm between God's justice uh, that he has to enact and his love for his creation? Well, the answer to that is Jesus. And, and we see that uh, in the text of Scripture, that, that he is the one who uh, selflessly gives his life as the atoning sacrifice at the cross. It's at the cross where we see a, a depiction of two things, uh, our depravity as sinners in need of a Savior and God's love who is willing uh, to reach down into the muck, into the mire of humanity and, and die for us. That's exactly what Jesus says on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He says uh, his last breath is, it is finished, right? His work has been done. The Hebrews author talks about how Jesus, um, uh, you know, with the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And that's why an, another verse that I've he I have here is from First John chapter 4, verse 10. The Bible says, and this is love, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's 1 John 4, 10. And so we've looked at God's divine justice. We've looked at his love and in, in satisfying his justice and his love, we see the cross of Jesus Christ. So now the question becomes, what do we do with that? You know, in order to receive that forgiveness, we're the ones that have to place our trust in God on the basis of um, what he has, has done for us. And we clearly see how that's done in Acts chapter 2, 38, where Peter preaches this gospel, the first gospel sermon that's recorded, and the people are pricked to the heart. They're, as, as the, I think it's the King James says, they're cut to the quick, and they ask, you know, hey, what? do we need to do? And he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you, your family, and all those who um, 
are, are far off to whom God may call. And so what God does is he leaves that decision to you and me. Uh, and so in a sense, God doesn't send people to hell. Uh, people send themselves to hell. God just gives people uh, what they've asked for by the way that they li- have lived in their life. And someone might say, well, why can't uh, God do something about that? Remember, he's all powerful and he's all loving. Well, well think about it this way. Um, it would be wrong. It would be morally wrong for God to force people from heaven into hell against their will. We would all agree with that. And so if that's true, then the reverse would be true as as well. It would be morally wrong for God to force people from hell into heaven. And, and I've actually heard this before, unfortunately, and it just breaks my heart every time I hear it. I'll talk to somebody who's not a believer and I, and I ask, you know, hey, if Christianity is true, uh, would you be a would you be a Christian? And there have been some people who have answered that question, say, no, I don't. If Christianity was true, I still wouldn't worship God because I wouldn't want to be in a heaven uh, with God. I would much rather take hell. And, and that's a um, just a radical statement. And here's the question that I have with regards to the free will issue. If God has done this, has sent Jesus as the divine substitute for our sin to satisfy God's justice, but also to show his love, and we reject that. Um, <laughs> what, what choice does God have out other than to give us what we deserve? And this is the point with regards to, to those first two assertions and Steingard's uh, question. If this scenario is even possible, then it, it follows that there is no inconsistency uh, and there has been no inconsistency, incompatibility demonstrated between the idea that God is all loving, that God is all powerful, and that some people uh, will use their freedom, their free, freedom of the will to reject God and then get exactly what they've asked for, which is, which is hell. Uh, the Bible makes it very clear that God desires every person to be saved. And the only obstacle, right, the only obstacle to universal salvation is our free will. So though, even though God is all powerful and even though God is all loving, God can't make everybody freely choose to follow him, to give his, to give their lives to him because it is logically impossible to make somebody do something freely. And so given human freedom and human stubbornness, um, and, and just the way in which most, the way in which people live in rebellion to God, uh, some people, uh, will go to hell despite God's desire and effort to save them. And that's a sobering thought, but I really do think that that scenario answers the question or provides a possibility that undercuts the two assertions associated with John Steingard's question. And, and my prayer is that at some point, I hope that, that John comes across this podcast and listens to it and that, that we could potentially dialogue about this very issue. And, and my prayer is that as you listen to it, that, that this has been edifying to you and has given you a tool in, in your tool belt. So when the time comes uh, to have that difficult conversation with a brother, with a sister, with a mom, with a dad, maybe even with a son or with a daughter, that you can face that question with boldness and confidence because you know that you're equipped to engage that conversation. Uh, hell, uh, if Christianity is true, hell is a, is a real place. And my petition to you who are listening, maybe you're not a Christian. I would hope that, um, you would contact me or, or, or contact somebody at the daily apologist and we can have a dialogue about the truth of the Christian worldview, because I don't want you to go to hell. Uh, I want you to be with, uh, everybody else that 
is a Christian that has lived faithfully, uh, that is that you know has put their faith in Jesus Christ, so that when the day does come uh, in which we face God, our Judge, uh, He can tell all of us together, "Well done, good and faithful servant." This certainly hasn't been a easy podcast to record. It has been an emotional podcast for me and just talking and thinking and studying about hell. But that's why we do what we do here at The Daily Apologist, so that uh, not only to equip you to engage culture, but hopefully the people that come across our content who are non-believers would consider the Christian worldview and become a Christian. And I just want to thank you guys for all the support that you've given us over the last three years, the support of this podcast over the last year and a half. I am honored and grateful to have you guys as listeners. And so that is the show. What we're going to do in the rest of July is we're going to have atheists come on and have a conversation about who they are, you know, about their experience, their background, what they think is the strongest uh, case for, for case for God and the weakest case for our, for God as well. And we'll have a dialogue about, hey, what would it take uh, for you to go back to being a Christian? So that is the Daily Apologist podcast. Thank you so much for listening in or watching. God bless you. And remember, equip yourself to engage culture. 